there's something about the zombie theme that lends itself really well to solitaire play for obvious reasons, I guess, that you're just in the right kind of game. You're getting the sense that you're all alone out there and combating these zombies that are coming to get you. And I've been spending a bunch of time playing this game, The Night. This is a new game from White Dog Games, and we can see the credits here. And it's given its solitaire suitability as nine. It is a solitaire game, although I suppose you could play it with somebody else. And um, it is definitely a low complexity kind of game. So let's take a look and see what they say about the game. And then I'm going to tell you what I think about the game, which is um, a whole bunch of things. It is a warm evening in a small Midwestern town in the summer of 1952. You control a group of seven terrified fugitives fleeing a widespread outbreak of zombies. Your group has sought refuge in an abandoned home, the occupants of the home likely having fled earlier upon hearing news on the radio of the advancing ghouls. As night falls, the menacing creatures have arrived at the home and are outside trying to get in. It's a fast play. The night is a fast play solitaire board game. There are 16 turns starting at dusk and ending at dawn. You win the game by surviving until daylight using your wits, found items, and luck to save yourself from the predatory undead creatures. It comes with a game board, which I will say is a paper map. So this is in the kind of format of a war game. It is a paper map, although I believe there is available a map on canvas. So I've got mine under a plexiglass here because the map is paper. Uh, 16 by 21, uh, well, this is the map. There's eight. There's 88 uh, counters in the map, and these are these are kind of, they're cool. This is what, one of my favorite type of war game chits. They're, I guess, compressed cardboard or something. They, they feel almost like wood, and um, they are laminated or they are screen, uh, silk screened. The game is all black and white in following with the theme um, and it delineates what they are. There's an example of play booklet we'll look at, quick reference and reference sheet and some rules, very, very basic sequence of play. It features the black and white 1950s era atmosphere and it um, says somewhere, maybe in the rules, that this is based off of the classic zombie movie. The Night is inspired and pays homage to the George Romero cult film classic Night of the Living Dead, now in public domain, which played a big role in creating the prolific zombie genre in film, books, and games. And so that is the guiding aesthetic of the game is this black and white kind of feel. We're taking a look here now at, I'm in turn sort of midway I believe I'm in going into turn seven of the game. And this gives you a sense of what the entire thing looks like. We have our characters here. Here's Karen with her baseball bat and her hatchet. She's been super effective standing by this window, preventing zombies coming in from this entry point here. There are six entry points, numbered entry points around the periphery of the map and you are rolling a d6 to see how many zombies come in each turn and you draw them from the zombie cup and then you are rolling d6s to place them around the periphery of the house. Karen's been great for me standing here in the, this is the office. You can see that there are littered around the house. There are some items. So here's some pistol ammo. Here's a Winchester rifle, which needs its ammo to be useful. Unfortunately, the ammo ended up in a random way. Well, actually, that's not the, that's different ammo. The, the rifle and uh, the shotgun ammo ended up in the tool shed out there with some boards due to the randomness of the set, of the setup for the game. We have old Harry here. He's got a shotgun with no ammo. And he has the keys and he has been using his keys. He just locked this door and therefore locking out this zombie, which is going to need to 
probably break through the window. This is an example of one of the zombies. There's a, in effect two different types of zombies. This says breaker zombie, and it has an easier way of getting into any window that is boarded up. We don't actually have a boarded up window yet. Over here, we have one right there. And there are regular zombies that are that do not have that have a harder time. Now the zombie stats have to do with their attack, in which would be in this case four, and their action point for this one is two. They can move two or do two different things. This zombie can do three different things. So it's very simple in terms of the stats for Harry here. We have his attack value is three, and he has four action points, meaning he could move or attack, and we'll take a look at what the various actions are. When he does combat, well, well let's look at a simpler example here. For combat, you are taking any value you have here in your attack value, in addition to any value you're getting from a weapon you may be carrying. So in this case, Judy's attack value would be five plus whatever she rolls on a d6 versus the zombie attack value. So in this case, the zombie attack value is, oh, well, let me not show you that. That's, that's a character that was made a zombie. Here we go. Oh, this zombie attack value is going to be seven versus whatever the zombie rolls on the d6. So in this particular case, you would roll your d6s and Judy gets a total attack value of nine and versus the attack value here of 12. And therefore, Judy is gone. Now, the combat is brutal in that it is one round. You're either going to be winning and the zombie is going to go away or you're going to be losing and you are going to turn dead. And if you turn dead, you get a dead character token here. Everybody has a dead character token. So you would turn into dead Judy here. And then per the sequence of play moving forward, there would be a next turn, a possibility for you to reanimate and you would there then reanimate if that was successful as the zombie Judy and then you would become zombie Judy. So there is, as you can see, very, very brutal <laughs> and the there's a lot of chance involved in terms of the D6 involvement because it doesn't matter on some level, you could have a ton of stuff and roll a one versus a six and you're gone. Partially because of that, I have been playing with some house rules. And before we get into what my house rules are, I want to just take a look at the actual rules because part of what makes this game so great is that the rules themselves say, here are some house rules that you can use. Here are some variants that you can use. And after playing the game a bunch of times, I chose to do that. So we'll look here at the, the very basic sequence of play. Well, the setups are that you uh, randomly place your humans, you randomly take five items and place them throughout the house. And there's a chart here for what the item is and you're placing it based on your D6 roll. And the zombies go in the cup and then you begin the game. So for the first turn of the game, you have one zombie outside and it will move toward the house and you can see what the zombies can do. They can conduct hand-to-hand -hand combat. Their second priority is to move adjacent to a live human or to open a window or a door and then, and then the zombies within the house are going to move to a room that has a character in it. And then you can see what the action points will be. So it costs one action point to move. So an action, a zombie with two AP could move two squares. It could move through an unboarded window to for two AP. It could attack. 
It could attack through an unboarded window, depending on its position, and it could attempt to break a boarded up window, and it will give you the instructions for breaking the window or door so we could see that you're rolling a d6 and if you're a normal zombie you're going to break that on a six but if you're a breaker zombie which is the first one we looked at you will succeed on a four five or six so those are much more uh, dangerous to anything that is boarded up well i admit i'm i uh, messed up my boards here your boards are stored in the basement well this is part of the random setup so your some of your boards are going to be in the basement and we see Tom is walking down here he's just picked up some boards and some of them are out in the tool shed now in my random setup there was only one boards that was in the, out in the tool shed all the rest of them were in the basement which was pretty awesome because you want to try to board things up as most as best you can to keep the zombies out we talked about combat already and now we'll look at so after the zombies act, we get to act. And the way the game is designed to work is you are rolling a D6 to determine the number of live humans that can act. So in this particular case, if I rolled a six, six of the seven humans, well, assuming seven were left, six of the seven humans could act. But if I rolled, well, <laughs> this isn't really, really working. If I rolled a one, only one human would be able to act in that entire turn. Well, what can the what can the humans do? Lots of things. And as in terms of the theme coming through really clearly, it does because you always feel like there's way more to do than you have actions available. So you can move, you can move through an unboarded window, you could board up a window or a door, you could remove the boards because you're not going to necessarily have enough boards to do everything you want, so you might be moving them around. There are keys, as we saw, you could lock or unlock a door. You could attack a zombie hand to hand. You could shoot a ranged weapon if you have that. You could pick up an item, or you could drop items, or you could give an item to another character adjacent to you. So those are a lot of things that you can possibly do and we can see it's a little bit of a, a kind of a little bit of a mess here and that is uh, partially because I've been filming but partially that's the way the game goes you get a lot there's just a, ends up being a lot going on so we've got Helen here in the living room I think this is the living room there's a comes with a very handy key to what is what here and we can see that is room four. Oh, it's called the sitting room. So we've got Helen there in the sitting room and she is dealing with a zombie that's a, a five strength zombie. That's pretty, pretty big. That's going to attack her next turn because it's right there. So she might wish to attack it. She's only going to be going in though with a plus four. So she's going to be overmatched here. That's that's a dangerous situation. There's also a the gun here and a hammer that um, are in, this is a, like a closet thing. She could get them, but she's got to open that door to, to uh, pick up, say, the hammer to give herself a benefit. So there's that option. You could, uh, I probably would take her and try to grab that grab that hammer because she's going to get attacked soon. And also if she moved away, this zombie only has this two AP, so it's not going to get her the next turn. So that's an option to do with her. Again, we do have, unfortunately, I've been ignoring this. <clears throat> the ammo that is out in the tool shed, but unless we unless we get that, we're not going to be able to use those weapons beyond using them um, to aid us in hand to hand, but we can't actually use them as ranged weapons, which otherwise they could be. And then we have Harry over here. I think I moved him. He, he's got the keys. So his goal is to, to go around and try to lock some, lock some doors, but the other door that he wants to lock is Oh, we got that. Oh, yeah. That was locked due to a random event. I forgot about that. 
And for example, we talked about, we got Tom here trying to get some boards and other people trying to get some boards. So basically you have six turns, 16 turns in order to do this. Now, the reason that I have these D6s on the turn order here and actually picked up a couple to demonstrate, I think I had them kind of like this. One of the house rules that I have decided on using, and it's sort of suggested by the rules, is that when I don't have a D6 down, I just automatically say I have six activations for my characters as opposed to rolling a D6. When I get to a turn that I have the D6, I will pick it up and roll it to give the random number of activations. Well, in that case, it was six, but again, you could see it was three. And the reason that I've done this is because I found the game was just getting absolutely impossible to manage with any bad too many die rolls in a row, like a one, two activations for your entire turn, I felt the game just became impossible. So I've been toying around with where to put these D6s. And as you can see, as it gets more desperate at the end, I am putting D6s down to mimic the rules as written. But that um, the optional rules do suggest that you could decide what how many just do a static number of activations for every turn. I didn't quite go that far, but I did I did do that. Uh, we're going to skip over how the ranged weapons work, but the bottom line is that different weapons that are ranged have give you different values and you can follow a chart to see what you're going to what you're going to get and if you have the weapon with no ammo, you can just use it to um, aid yourself in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is a victory point game to some extent. You can see how well you've done, but the bottom line is you have to survive and that overtakes. So it doesn't feel like a victory point based game because you're just desperate to get <laughs> to, to be saved at all, to have anybody left. What's also thematic and neat about it is it says at the beginning of the game to choose one character, you can choose it randomly or, or choose it not randomly, say I chose Helen, and I'm going to say that Helen is my hero. I have to prioritize keeping her alive to get those 10 additional points, so those 10 points, everyone, everyone else is just worth five. So that is, that's a really simple additional rule that becomes very thematic because you you do start to make choices to save the one that is your hero. In terms of there are different setup, different scenarios that they suggest as possibilities, and um, I'm not going to spend the time going through them, but they're in effect different setups that happen. In terms of the rules changes, and it does say here, this is a solitaire game, so imagine yourself giving Ben a chainsaw at the start. Go for it. Below are some ideas you might want to explore to reduce or increase the character's combat strengths. I can't imagine reducing them or action points or keeping them all the same. We talked about that. Same thing for the zombies. Again, hard to imagine making it harder. It's already pretty hard. Change the way the zombies enter. Maybe make them all enter from the basement. Um, I wouldn't like them all coming from a single entry point. Part of what, you know, it's in its effect, it's a tower defense game and like where they show up is just, it does give you the sense of that they're just, they're surrounding you at a certain point and they're entering through, this is the porch and they're entering through windows. So that is, that's pretty effective. Some other options, the uh, dark yard is a cool idea, meaning that it's harder to walk outside because it's dark. You could make it optional, better to shoot the zombies, so you could shoot twice during a turn, or you could have each shot cost just one AP instead of two, and some other uh, concepts. The unreliable weapons is kind of cool that if you roll a one when you're shooting, and then you roll another one, your weapon is broken. Or you could also have them running out of ammo, which is, um, I like that. There are some tables for random events, and I have been playing with those, and that's actually how I got this door locked randomly, which was awesome, because it was a random event that I rolled. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. I'm not going to go, some of them, it, the surprise of that is kind of neat, so I'm not going to 
show you that so much, but that is something that you can put into the game and roll for either each turn or you could decide on the odd turns, on the even turns. You can also assign some attributes to your characters. Again, you could either roll randomly or you could choose and you could choose that some, I mean, if it were me, I would choose, I haven't done this yet, but I would choose the positive attributes because again, the game is hard enough as it is. So for example, you could say, oh, Helen here, she's an athlete, so she's going to get an extra action point per turn. So you would need to remember that she had five action points instead of four. Or you could even say somebody is a coward or that they're a fighter and they get a benefit to the combat strength. So that is, um, I, I like that. I haven't really incorporated that yet because I've been trying to work out I've been trying to work out my other rules to basically mitigate the possibility of ending up with like one or two activated characters or three activated characters a turn based on the, a bad D6 roll at the outset. Because again, the other thing is you're also rolling the D6 to see how many zombies come in a turn. So if I rolled that one, I would just go to the draw cup and pull in the one random zombie, and then I would roll a d6 to place the zombie somewhere, and it would come in at entry point five. On the other hand, if I rolled, for example, five zombies coming onto the map, and only one action point, you get the, you get the, you get the point. You could just get really overrun, and on the one hand, you could say, well, being overrun is what a zombie game is all about. True, but on the other hand, if that happens too much, it just becomes an exercise, for me at least, in frustration. So this this mechanism has been working for me because it allows the unpredictability of the number of action points where I see those D6s and that increases as, the, as things get more desperate, but it gives me more opportunity at the beginning. And I had a few, you can't see here, but I think I started out like something like this where I was just giving myself a chance at the beginning to try to set my characters up, to try to get some boards, to try to, I never got out to the tool shed, but in theory, I, I had some choices to make and I could have done that. There are also some rules for expanding the game to play with two players. And the um, final note here, just change what you want and um, have fun with it. And indeed it does work the, the the rules are flexible enough that the game can accept rules modifications and again part of the part of the fun of it is thinking about what you might do to modify the rules the other thing i have done is i have placed i started out my characters with an item each randomly as well as placed the items in the house so i was making use of all of the items in the game i said that the a final modification I did was for combat, which is that I didn't like the fact that combat was only one time, win, lose, you know, you're dead or they're dead. So what I said was if a character encountered a zombie and they had combat, so let's say Karen here had her, let's say she had her hatchet and um, let's say she had her hatchet and her baseball bat and she encountered this zombie here and she managed to lose because you definitely could. It's random, even though she would be having a six versus a four, obviously she could lose. If she lost, she wasn't immediately dead. What what it meant was she lost an item. So, and then that, that combat was over and then the game proceeded as normal. So it gave another round of combat. You First you lost an item and then you, and in the hand-to-hand -hand was when you would become uh, potentially uh, turned into a zombie or at least dead, and then possibility of reanimation, which would happen at the next turn based on a D6 roll. So that was another of the house rules that I added in. Why? Because it let me, first of all, use all the items that there are. Because one thing I, I don't like in a game when it has a lot of materials you're not using. And there's a whole bunch of fun items here and 
in the regular setup, you're not using a lot of them. So number one, you get to use all the stuff. And number two, or at least potentially use all the stuff because some of it is still scattered around the house that you have to pick up. And number two, it gave more opportunity to not just immediately die. And thematically, my point was, well, if you're fighting a zombie with an item as opposed to hand to hand, if you lose, you know, they take the item, but you're still preserved. You know, you yourself can still possibly survive. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's definitely an involving game. And um, my, my biggest complaint, honestly, is while I like the art on the cover, it is like a borderline too grotesque. And I've just, I mean, as a parent, one of my kids is just, I can't, I got to put the box up to, upside down and not show the cover. It's just, it's a little much, but um, it's a zombie game. So I suppose that's what you would expect.